morning again. Uh, I'm really pleased to see that uh, you decided to stay for this last round table uh, with our guests, uh, speakers, intervenants in this round table, which is designed to address issues related to uh, social policy and formal uh, politics, recognition, rights. We feel it's important to give room in a, in a scientific conference such as ours to people who um, have the ability, the opportunity, the privilege, but also take risks, political risks, in addressing many of the issues that relate to our daily lives. Um, we do know that historically, uh, LGBTQI activism has um, emerged in resistance to the lack of recognition. So historically, we seem to have difficulties in raising um, useful dialogue amongst many of us. And this conference, as you know, Queering Friendship, is also about uh, bringing, uh, bridging the gaps, about making connections. And in the last Queering Conference, Queering Parenting, we already had a roundtable similar to this one, in which we invited some of our decision makers um, nationally and internationally, and it was a very productive session. So I'm sure we will all know how to make best use of this time and this opportunity. So um, I have here with me uh, Elisa Zviedo, who has been um, an activist for a very long time, although uh, nobody would say so based on this. Uh, but she has been around for quite a long time and very, very uh, voiceful about trans rights. And we invited her here because she does politics, even not in the, in the formal sense of the word, but she does politics. And then we also invited João Costa, who is the Secretary of State of Education, who uh, cannot be here today. Um, he had to leave the country, um, not in a way that forever. <laughs> he, <didn't laughs> he had an appointment, an appointment um, in Paris uh, in relation to, to his duties, so he cannot be here today, but he um, recorded the video on purpose for us, so we will be hearing his address at the end of the first set of interventions. Um, also, Marisa Matias, uh, who was supposed to be online through Skype, just sent us a message saying that she had to leave, she could not uh, uh, wait, so she will not be <coughs> present as such. But we do have Paula Cristina Marques, who um, is the representative of the City Council of Lisbon, uh, with responsibilities in the... Um, in cohabitation. Housing, in the housing uh, sector, and in representation of Rosa Monteiro, the Secretary of State for um, Gender Equality and Citizenship, we have Teresa Fragoso, who's the President of the Commission for um, in equality, Gender Equality and Citizenship. So, um, I'm very, very happy that you are here physically. And we will start with a round of uh, interventions, short ones, seven minutes at the most, and then we'll, we'll open up the floor for debate. We'll be ending um, before uh, one. Okay, thank you. We we'll start with Hi. Hi, everyone. Good after morning. <laughs> um, I should start by saying that if ever I disappear during the presentation and I go back there, it's because I'm getting my heartburn medicine because I'm feeling kind of heartburny. But I'll take the microphone and I'll just keep talking if ever I do that. Uh, just don't be surprised. And so I'd like to start by thanking uh, Queering, uh, this event, the Intimate Project, for having me here. And uh, I think I'm kind of developing a bad reputation at the Center of Social Studies in Coimbra, because they sometimes invite me to talk in things that are related to a subject, and I usually feel like I'm against it, and so I just go the other way around. And so the other day I was talking about methodologies and science, and I went, uh, not that my views are that strictly narrowed, but I decided I would go with a uh, an anti-scientific approach in a way. Uh, but in my defense it was a panel on 
new me uh, new methodologies, different methodologies. So like it was called for, and so here I was invited to this table on policy making, and I will talk to you about how uh, I'm sick of having anything to do with it. Uh, even though I guess I still kind of do have something to do with it, it's a complicated relationship. Uh, I will tell you so the word slide, the very tradition, when it is slide. And so, yeah, I'm here, and for the first time in my life I wrote my <laughs> presentation, so everyone should be very proud of me. So I'm here today to talk to you about structures, uh, power, reform and legislation, and how they will ultimately fail you. And so here I'll make the note that uh, I do work on policy making. I will talk about this further in the in the debate if anyone wants to. And I very much respect legislation and policy making that is made uh, for the advance the advance of material well-being in queer people's lives. Uh, but I will leave the other people on this panel to talk about that. I will elaborate elsewhere. This talk will be pessimistic. This is not a, a weakness of his, it's a strength. I stay pessimistic uh, to stay angry. And this was mentioned in one of the parallel sessions yesterday. Because when you're angry, you avoid the domestication and the docialization uh, of your body that hopefulness can bring. Because hopefulness, uh, and recently, Linda Quebrada, which is a biofunk uh, singer from Brazil, very political, a trans sister of mine. Uh, she was in Lisbon and she gave a talk where in the middle of it she mentioned how <coughs> she's sick of hope because hope leads you to wait. Slide. And in Portuguese you should know that this... Um, the PowerPoint's broken. So in Portuguese it has the same etymological uh, origin. So to hope and to wait Esperança, esperar. And so she was speaking in Portuguese, which I think is a much more poetic and beautiful language to elaborate politics on than English, uh, as you can see. And so she was like, I'm sick of hoping because I'm sick of waiting. Because when we hope, we wait, we don't act political change. We're just waiting for it to fall on our laps. Um, and so I'm done waiting. Like, I choose to be angry and I invite you all to join me. Uh, and we pessimists can also, in any way, have a good time, I promise you that. And so the weakness of this talk is not that it is pessimistic, it might be, however, that it is fatalist, uh, in a very uh, fado philosophy sense of the word. I think fatalism is dangerous to political action, as dangerous as hopefulness can be. When you are hopeful, we wait for change. When we are fatalist, we accept that we cannot bring it about but pessimism, like, I will use swear words throughout this presentation. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to use swear words, Christian. And so in pessimism, we know it will be shit, but that's not stopping us. And who knows, we might surprise ourselves. Oh, sorry, there was this hilarious side note, slide. And so like when you're hoping, you're in a passive position. And if we're going for a passive position, I prefer, like sexually, this is a sexual joke, I would go for also a lyric from Linda Quebrada in another song, where she says, Ser bicha não é só dar o cu, é também poder resistir. This can vaguely translate to either being a fag or being a queer, because the word bicha in Portuguese can have this like strictly male gay meaning or a more generic queer meaning. So like being queer is not just taking up the ass, it is also to be able to resist. <coughs> so yeah. Uh, so where might I be fatalist? I'll get to it shortly. So structures, power, reform, legislation. When I think about contemporary societies, and here like I think it's hilarious that you talked about uh, architecture just now, because I will just stick to basic geometry, because I'm basic in that way. I think about uh, contemporary society when I think about power structures as a cylinder. The cylinder of doom. I think about it as a cylinder in the sense that I think about it rotating and uh, pushing people out and leaving people in that have <coughs> the correct magnetism that would allow them to be citizens and so uh, the fags, the blacks, the trans will go out. So this structure is capitalism, it's transphobia, it's racism, and I always imagine it rotating and pushing people out. 
And then like if you're like a, a nice person, you say like this is not cool, like people are being left out, people are dying, people are being marginalized. So like maybe we should do something about it. Activism. And I think there are two ways, or this is very binary of me, call me out on it. But uh, I think we can think about two ways on how we can approach activism. <laughs> and so like uh, how to fight the, the evil cylinder of doom. Uh, and so some people think assimilationism, some people think radicalism. Some people don't think at all, some people think beyond it. Uh, I, I think like this. And so assimilationism, I think, is a, a way of approaching activism that believes society, aka the evil cylinder of doom, can be reformed, changed, adapted, reshaped, as to include and deodorize those who were previously authorized by its structures. And so re-include them <coughs> in this structure that excluded them. And then radicals, as going to the roots, would believe that reform is not in fact possible, uh, as in fact the violence enacted by the cylinder of society is a problem that stems in its base and in its roots and it, isn't, it would not be... It follows that any process of change, from a radical point of view, does not merit the title of change if it should not change structurally what the structure is, instead of trying to mend it and keep on going with it. I'm wearing very tight clothing, so I'm not breathing very well. Like, this is internalized misogyny, by the way. <laughs> no one's laughing. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and though I like to believe I think radically, that does not necessarily mean that my practices will follow my rationale. And so I was invited to this panel, I suppose, amongst other things, for my work uh, in the recently passed gender identity law, for example. Uh, I have uh, there are other activists here in the room who are also very active in this process. Uh, but I am tired of speaking law, and I am tired of thinking law. I am sad and I am angry that we celebrate legal victories. It's between gimmicks. I'm attacking it. I'm taking truth away from it. Because I don't think they're victories. I think like... This is going to be... No, I'm going to say the words I wrote. I think passing a law in a bourgeois neoliberal representative democracy cannot even remotely be framed as a victory. Even if it brings about or can help bring about social change, even if it helps materially some queer people's lives. I could not personally frame this as a victory or as something to celebrate. Like, good it's there, if it's good it's there, but let's not wait, now that it's done, let's not waste time there, let's not stop, let's keep on going, or just undoing. And... So I, I believe this law, for example, the gender identity law I helped work on, I believe it is important, otherwise I would not have wasted my time uh, uh, working on it and lobbying on it. But for example, we now say full legal gender recognition exists for adults in Portugal. We forget to mention that it costs 200, uh, 200, yeah, 200 euros. So for example, last week I went to legally change my name. The Portuguese state, vis-à-vis -vis the Portuguese state, I am now called Alice Luna. Uh, this also means that I was left with three to six euros to my name last week. I will talk about precarity and perhaps cry. Uh, this means that having access to my legal gender recognition meant that, for example, yesterday, I'm going to have water to pretend I'm not crying, my cousin. <laughs> meant that yesterday, <laughs> Uh, when everyone went out to lunch, I sat alone with my Tupperware, delicious uh, vegetables, assortment of vegetables, and grilled chicken I brought from home. But I was not able to be part of the social uh, and enriching moment of a conference that is fraternizing with people, uh, and the coffee breaks are short, and so lunch is amazing. Uh, and so, at that moment, when I was sitting alone in front of the building, I, and this is a conference that talks about care. And I did not feel as if the state cared for me very much, having taken $200 to recognize my identity. I did, however, feel cared for 
uh, by the two queer cuties who went out to get lunch but asked for a takeaway so they could come back and keep me company. I felt cared for the person who yesterday, I'm talking about only monetary care and uh, financial material care, but of course it takes other dimensions. But I'm also, I felt cared for the person that gave me yesterday money so that I could take a cab to come watch Jack Halberstam this morning. Otherwise, I would not have come. I live in the suburbs. Uh, the metro is my only mode of transportation to the in and out of the city. And so I would not have been able to hear this wonderful talk that I very much enjoyed this morning. So I felt cared for, not by the state, or institutions that are meant in a would-be welfare state to take care of me, but for my queer brothers and sisters and siblings in general. And so I think I ran out of time, so I will shorten the end uh, of this, but I really wanted to make this point, and as my voice is failing, it is harder to uh, make it fast, but now I think my voice will return to normal speed. There! I'm funny again. Hi! Um, and so, I'm afraid this has been oversimplistic, in theory I only have seven minutes, so like, please feel free to ask anything, either about the law or whatever, in a, so that I can elaborate later, if you'd be interested in that. Uh, but so I'll conclude in three points. Slide? No, oh, I forgot this slide. <laughs> slide. And so, my conclusion for all the random thoughts is like, Fatalism, divide and conquer, radical care. Why fatalism? Because I am really afraid structures are not changeable. Like, mm, I was very inspired by uh, Jack's thought this morning in how, I don't know if everyone was there, <coughs> but on the idea of instead of throwing the building just to the ground, just making precise incisions that maybe will be enough to change it without tearing everything apart, which is dangerous and violent, and then rebuilding. Uh, I am fatalist maybe in the sense that I'm not sure we can make those incise cuts. I'm not sure if maybe we don't really need to tear the building apart. So I'm hoping someone will change my mind, because being fatalist is uh, too narrow, sadly. And so the next slide, divide and conquer. I'm thinking about assimilationism. Oh, no. Oh, sorry, this is just a follow quote that I thought would be hilarious to put on the fatalist slide because it's about how like a bad star is ruling your fate and there's the laws of your heart and you can lie to them but like you're set on your path. And I'm sad to, to emotionally connect to this lyric slide. And so yeah, divide and conquer. So like it has been used by uh, several known imperial rules like Caesar, Napoleon and patriarchy in general. And so I talk about assimilationism. <coughs> I had this written down, I am just talking. So assimilationism tries to make the others into citizens, but in order to assimilate, you have to appeal to the structure, to the structure's discourses. And of course, you try to open them. For example, marriage, the structure says, marriage is monogamic between a man and a woman. And then like you grab it and you say, marriage is monogamic, between two people who love each other. And so you are appealing to the structure and changing it a bit. And so some people cannot go into the structure, but it still leaves so many people out. You cannot put everyone in the structure. It will keep rotating. You can, uh, this only goes like, you can put in the gays, but it will always leave out the facts. You can put in the lesbians, but it will always leave out the dykes and you can put in the, the transsexuals, but it will always leave out the trannies. And so, yeah, uh, and it divides us in what would be queer community between the good queer subjects and the bad queer subjects. Uh, and this weakens us, and this makes us more vulnerable to the attacks we suffer. And to finalize, I think it is this radical approach. Uh, la communauté, comment dire en français? Uh, this radical approach of care, I think it is the experiences of care, of kinship, of friendship, of whatever you want to call it, uh, that we share between ourselves, as I've experienced in this conference and in my life, that we can then take the situations and imagine other possibilities, imagine other futures, <laughs> and by imagining them we have a reference that we can try to follow to make the, them happen. And so to conclude, like try to convince me otherwise from what I said. 
I would love for you to convince me otherwise. If you convince me otherwise, then I, would, I think I would be a much happier, much more well-adjusted citizen. Are you one of those? Are you comfortable? Thank you. Thank you, Elise. Um, how should we proceed? Okay, so I wish Paula Cristina. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Paula March, and um, I was hearing, uh, listening to Elise, and uh, thinking about is it really, uh, am I really going to talk about policymaker and making and as a uh, someone that is elected in local government, or am I going to talk as an activist? And, well, Christina really invited me to talk <laughs> with you about, uh, <clears throat> as, as a policymaker and as a local elected uh, in the, government, the city government. But it, it's, it's, it's really not uh, easy to uh, separate when you are an activist uh, and when you are someone from that community. And so I think it's, uh, well, I'll, I'll try to, to give a, a link about how can we, as a policy makers in local government, um, how can we uh, bring, uh, produce policies on uh, gender equality, uh, on, and how can we help to transform the city uh, making it a more open and more open. I'm not going to say more open and more fair, not more anything more, okay? More open and more fair city. Um, and <coughs> something that uh, I, I, I went, I went, I entered in the municipality of Lisbon in 2009. Uh, and only in 2013, I was elected for the, the city government as a, as a deputy mayor for housing and local development. Um, and the first thing that um, was really um, shocking for me is the language that people used in uh, uh, formal uh, regulations and formal, uh, in, in, in the city, formal regulations uh, about the housing uh, access and housing managing the, local, the public housing uh, programs. And <coughs> It took a while to change it. It really took a while to change it. Um, but we did. We did change it. Uh, we did remove uh, from the from legal uh, regulations um, the universal uh, masculine uh, uh, language. Uh, we did. Uh, re we did remove the traditional. Uh, but because it was like this in 2009, 2009 the traditional uh, family structure, mm -hmm. for example, if someone applied uh, to a public tender for housing, uh, the concept was the traditional family. Uh, hetero family, uh, mother, father, children, that was it. That was the traditional approach on families. And the first thing we did, we did is, no, it's not. We have different kinds of families. Uh, we have uh, different kinds of um, constitution, fam the f family constitutions. And so the first thing we did was to change it. And to change it, and at least I know we were reading many things. <laughs> and yes, it's important to have on the law and on the, on the formal uh, on the legal uh, documents, it is important to have this kind of changes. Uh, of course, we cannot stop there. We must go behind it, behind it. But it is important to have it, because nowadays, uh, when someone wants to apply to a house uh, in the several different uh, programs in the municipality, um, it's you who defines which is your kind of family. It's not pre-defined. Uh, you do say, what is your family? Uh, if, you, if your family is a mother, a mother, a son, a mother, a father, a son, a father, a father, a son, 
a mother, a mother, a mother, a son, you decide what kind of family you have. Okay? So it is different to have illegal, uh, illegal regulations. Maybe it's easier on local government than on, on uh, central administration. I do, I, do, I do think that it's easier in a local government level to have these kind of changes than on, uh, on uh, central administration. Maybe, I don't know. It's, I think for us, as, a man, as a, someone that is more the manage, the managing, managing sorry, um, the direct programs in the city, I think it's easier for us to do it. <coughs> And we change it also <coughs> the language, and uh, because language has concepts with it, and we change it also, um, and it was really hard also with the technicians from the municipality regarding, for example, the relationship with uh, the relation with the citizens that were uh, non-binary, that people that were queer people. I remember someone in, in some, some some time asked me. There's a person, they were not saying a man or a woman, there's a person that has the name, but I think the name, it's not what we think that it's uh, the, is, uh, biological sex, and what should we do? Because you have a legal frame to apply to a public uh, um, program. But only the fact that we had a technician asking, making this, this, uh, this question and thinking about it since, 19, since 2009 to 2017, 18, to have this long walk until uh, someone that was not on, even think about uh, what, what could be uh, the LGBTQI a community uh, to someone that really thinks about it and propose actions about it in local administration. Come on, it's really, really, it's for me, it's really an achievement. I can, I can tell you, it's really an achievement. Um, so language and uh, changing uh, regulations and acting uh, with the public servants that are in, in, the, in the front office with citizens, I think it's one of the things that it's our task to do. And maybe it's our task to do also because, in my case, I'm also an activist and I'm a part of the community. Uh, and I know such people don't really, in public administration, always say that you shouldn't make yourself an example. Well, I cannot separate being an activist or from being a, a local government, from the local government. So what I do, it's really use my example um, just to say, <coughs> you know, there's other realities from the one, the small ones that you live in, from the small box that you are living in. And when I'm talking about this, I'm talking about the public servants, that uh, the administration that works with me, but all, also, dear Alice, the peer cylinder that sometimes we face uh, and I remember the first time that I, uh, I was with my mate uh, in an official, official uh, event and <clears throat> my mate is a trans uh, person so uh, and people ask me uh, who is going to, uh, to be your, uh, to escort you, uh, the plus one uh, and I said well in my case plus one, okay, okay, let's start with plus one. Uh, but who is going to ex escort you to, and it was the, that uh, solemn thing about being, becoming and, and uh, signing the, the I don't know how to say it in English, uh, it's, it's protocol. protocol when you really become, the ritual. Uh, the ritual that when you sign and you really become the, the deputy mayor uh, after being elected. So it is the protocol moment. And I said, okay, it's, uh, I'm not going to say the name, but it's X person. And, and they said, only, the, the, only that, that name and the, the, the family name? No, it's that name. It's my maid. And uh, she's going to, to, to join me. And when she arrived, it was really 
but is a she, is not a she, what, uh, well, there's no, there was no subject about it. And this is in 2013, and today, uh, it's not a subject, it's not anymore. Uh, with my peers, I'm talking with my peers. So, uh, what we have to fight is, if we have to fight between, uh, for example, my peers in, uh, in the municipality, we have to fight it on the, on the service, on the public uh, uh, practice, and we have to put it on public policies. So what, um, what the municipality is doing is uh, not with the, the housing portfolio, housing and local development portfolio, uh, but with the social rights portfolio. Um, it's implanting, it's discussing nowadays the first uh, local plan, uh, the, first, the first LGBT quiet EU uh, municipal plan. Um, so it's, it's the first time that uh, we, have, we are going to discuss about what is the, uh, the approach that LGBTQI uh, community wants in the city, for the city, uh, for the housing, for the, the public space, how to leave the public space, how to the, the difficulties that people feel on uh, um, searching for a house. Uh, searching for uh, safe places where people do feel uh, comfortable. How do we leave the public space? How do we face and how we, f how we fight the, the prejudice? Um, so it is one, it's, 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 I, I know it's baby steps, at least. I know it's baby steps. Uh, but I think uh, if we go together uh, and uh, to have People like you and people like some other persons that uh, work and fight in the city for LGBTQI community. Uh, I'm not going to say side by side because sometimes it's not possible to be side by side, but on the same way uh, with local government on our baby children steps that I hope to go to grown up steps. Um, I think it's uh, it's worth to do it because otherwise, uh, and also I think having a, uh, grabbing the opportunity to have people on local government and on central government that have this kind of approach, because I'm quite sure that was never it was not like this, and I'm afraid that maybe in the future, uh, if we don't make it ground. Uh, steps and we make it ground on the cities and on the structures and the, uh, on the citizens. Um, if we change uh, and uh, the orientation on local and central government change, I think it will be really the cylinder. It will really, really, really be uh, a lot more heavy than it is now. So uh for the first round it would, would be my my first intervention and um saying that uh <clears throat> i would like to make a challenge um uh, parallel to housing uh we have the local government the local uh, development structure in the city and what i would like to have and i really would like to have it's a lot of uh, organizations, more formal, more informal organizations, being using our facilities in public space, in public uh, buildings, to uh, develop the projects that they would like uh, to do in the city. Um, as a partner, if you want, with a, with a municipality, or if you don't want to be a partner, and I do understand it, just use the facilities uh, that we have in public buildings um, to develop to develop the, the, the projects and the manifestos and uh, organizing the, the fight that we have to do in the city. So it's a challenge that I would like to, to make to everyone. So good morning to all. Um, as Cristina already introduced me, I'm Teresa Fragoso, I'm the head of the Portuguese Commission for Gender Equality, meaning the 
This is the public uh, structure, a body, uh, in charge of promoting equality uh, regarding well, uh, men and women and also uh, more recently, but more recently is the last uh, 10 years because we are 40 years old, the Commission for Gender Equality in Portugal. So for the past 10 years we're also in charge of public policy regarding LGBTQI rights. So thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm also here on behalf of the Secretary of State, and fortunately she couldn't be here this morning. Today, the 18th of October, is also the European Day to fight trafficking in human beings. So she's in Parliament uh, in a big debate about this topic, and today we'll also be launching a campaign regarding trafficking in human beings. And uh, before I officially start, uh, I would like just to comment on what Paula just said at the end. And, and a bit picking up on what Elise said in terms of the importance, and, and of course I come from the central administration, uh, and for us why it is important to have legislation, things in writing, and of course also in the structures, the city structures, the, the country structures. And I'm not so sure that sometimes it's easier in local municipalities to change the rules. Sometimes if the environment is uh, appropriate, you can have important changes like we had recently. Uh, in Parliament. But the importance to have laws and structures is, of course, when we're uh, going through the, the, the political environment that we are in the world with extreme right and, and this type of uh, uh, xenophobia and, and other kinds of discrimination, at least if you have it in the law, it's harder to uh, uh, go back. But still, there's a risk of uh, losing already acquired rights. So it's always important to have it in writing. Also because sometimes, even if people are not radicals and extremists, they always will interpret um, the practices. So if it's not in writing, and even in writing we can interpret the law, but we, there will be a doctrine, there will be a, how it is interpreted as usual. So the more you have it in writing, the more you have it ingrained in the structures, the hardest it will be in the future, if uh, uh, political changes arise, to go back. So, of course, I do come from the public sector and, and public policy, so I do value this. But having said that, I also value uh, uh, activism. And uh, I was never an activist on LGBTQI rights. I come from the youth sector, uh, youth uh, NGOs. I did work with the Portuguese uh, uh, oldest uh, LGBTI structure, ILGA, for some t work as a volunteer. Uh, but for me, and I, I worked from my heart, my, my topic of passion was women's rights. So I thought I would be more useful on women's rights. And that's uh, how I started and now I'm in public service. Uh, I, I, I'm not a public servant, but I'm, I'm in this capacity. And I'm very proud of being in this capacity because I also believe um, in the importance of changing from the inside of the structures because the cylinder you mentioned, or uh, excluding people, it will be harder if the structures are uh, less aware, and less open, as, and less fair, as Paula said it. So uh, it's important to work from within the structures and make sure that the structures are wide enough so that no one is left out. So, uh, and also, i also like to mention that um, I do come from the structure, but I don't like clear borders in the sense that, yes, I'm an activist, but I, I choose to do it from within public administration. And you can act uh, where you identify yourself more with or where you have the opportunity to produce the biggest change according to your own talents and, and what you think is your mission in this earth, if you can talk like that. So for me, uh, my activism is within the structures, within public service. So, Going back to the more official speech, <laughs> because I am here on this, uh, uh, in this capacity, I would like to congratulate, first of all, Christina and all the team for this study and the final conference of this study. This has been a five-year long uh, process, and this is, of course, very relevant for us, also for the state, because, as I said, it's only since 2007 that the Commission for Gender Equality started to implement policies on LGBTQI rights, uh, mainly because of the European year for equal opportunities for all. And uh, this commission was uh, the leading uh, uh, public uh, body uh, in coordinating all the other non-discrimination or anti-discrimination bodies in, in public administration, 
on uh, inclusion of religion, uh, race and ethnicity, uh, people with disabilities, etc. Issues of age, although we still don't have an official body on issues of age, we do have for children uh, at, uh, at risk, but not for the elderly. But still, the Commission for Gender Equality was the one uh, um, coordinating these efforts from the, from the state. And uh, there was no official body at that time in charge of LGBTQI rights. So it became obvious that because of our history and working for women's rights and later on gender equality as the concepts also uh, uh, develop, and of course we don't want just the rights of women, we want the rights of everybody and we know that we can only, again, change reality if we involve everybody and so of course, yes, we don't discriminate men. Uh, we like men very much, as much we like women. We uh, ensure men's rights uh, uh, as well, but we do have uh, the clear understanding that usually women are more um, discriminated in, in more areas. So this is quite clear for us. And again, when, we, when it comes to LGBTQI rights, again, women are less visible, are less vocal. So again, this uh, um, perspective. So it became our role. And for the first time this year in 2018, we have a national action plan to uh, fight discrimination against LGBTI uh, uh, people. And uh, basically this plan is under a strategy, a 12 year long strategy, because we try to align our strategies, our uh, uh, public strategies with the, the UN 2030 agenda for sustainable development. So our new strategy uh, will follow uh, until 2030, but we have three pillars, let's call it, or three action plans under this strategy with a more operational perspective. So there are four-year action plans, one to promote gender e equality but focusing on women and right, uh, men and women's rights, the other one focusing on violence, violence against women, gender-based violence in domestic sphere, and the third one, and this is the innovation, it's the first time that we have a specific action plan on LGBTQI rights. And the importance uh, of being here today and of course listening to the various sectors and, and hopefully in the debate listening to, to all of you is because we also privileged in this strategy um, three uh, uh, transversal perspectives. One is partnerships. The state does not work alone, it cannot achieve its, uh, its purposes alone. So the, the main partnerships are of course one with academia, uh, uh, second with, uh, or not in an order, I'm just uh, saying it, with NGOs, with civil society, and with other relevant agents, uh, 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 the business sector, uh, whomever uh, is relevant in, in uh, development of our society. So this partnership is something that we um, promote. The, the, the other uh, transversal perspective is uh, making sure that these policies are uh, in the whole of the territory of Portugal. So we work very closely with local municipalities, with local governments. Um, we are planning to uh, work in partnership with the Lisbon municipality in developing this first uh, action plan in Lisbon for LGBTQI rights. Uh, but also we work with all the municipalities in Portugal, some of them, there's a, a huge asymmetry, some are very big, some are very small, some don't have resources, they don't have many civil servants, the capacities is, sometimes are low, the, 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 the budgets are not always very strong, but they're the ones uh, that are closer to the population, and so we see this as the opportunity to bring uh, gender equality policies uh, close to where the, the people are. So. Since this plan was approved on LGBTQI rights, we are now changing a uh, structure that we had when worked with, working with local municipalities. We had these sort of reference uh, guidelines for uh, municipalities to develop their uh, equality plans, and now we are including LGBTQI uh, uh, areas. Because before we were uh, talking about uh, the labor market, reconciling family and, and work, um, uh, having structures to support uh, the children and the elderly, also uh, many, many uh, policies facing, uh, preventing and, and supporting victims of domestic violence, but uh, LGBTQI rights were a bit, again, marginal. So for, since this plan was approved, we are now revising these uh, uh, guidelines with the municipalities and we do see uh, an openness and an interest. Just this week, uh, Sandra Saleira, I'm not sure if she's still here with us, 
She was, she thank was. you, Sandra. She, uh, she was supporting the Commission for Gender Equality in partnership with the, the juridical center of government. Uh, this is a, a public body as well. And they were giving training on uh, civil servants from uh, central public administration on LGBTQI rights. And the room was full and people were asking questions. At the end I arrived and they couldn't care less about me. They kept on asking questions. Uh, to Sandra because they were really interested in understanding and how to do their jobs in, in the, the best and in most inclusive way. So uh, we do see uh, in the past 10 years, um, it's, it's, it's low, uh, slow as you said, but at the same time it's, it's quite a fast pace. Um, I'm a woman, I've been working mostly focusing in my past on gender, women's rights and I always want things taken care of yesterday. Tomorrow is already too late. I want equality now. But being in public administration, I know things take time. And 10 years' time is, is uh, very fast, I would say. So I'm happy. I can see so many significant changes in, still in my lifetime, and I'm not that old, I hope. <laughs> so anyway, uh, uh, moving along, uh, I wanted to uh, talk a bit about the role of SIG, and uh, also based on this, uh, on this uh, plan, we are very much focusing on knowledge, collecting data, understanding the reality. We cannot uh, uh, provide the good uh, policy measures if we don't understand the needs. This can be tricky. We cannot ask certain questions. It can be dis perceived as discriminatory. If I start asking people, what is your uh, sexual orientation? I need it for statistics. So this is something we're now debating, how to collect particular data, but in order to uh, protect people's uh, um, security and, and, and being free from, from discrimination. Um, in fact, the first uh, public study, uh, it was financed through the Commission for Gender Equality, was launched in 2011 uh, by two uh, uh, major in investigators in this area as well, José uh, Sanguet and Miguel Valdalmaida. And so we're, we're proud that uh, we're doing this work. The Commission for Gender Equality is pushing also for this work. And, uh, and that we liaise with academia because we do need knowledge, we do need uh, uh, um, in research in order to inform uh, public policy. Sometimes we're so busy doing things, evaluating the results, that we don't have the time and maybe we don't have the expertise to do the research, to go more in depth. So that's why we privilege these partnerships. Um, but I also want to uh, share some of the positive uh, results that we have. Um, we uh, do uh, have access to public funding from the EU and also uh, uh, um, sources of public funding uh, to push for specific uh, services and, and other, other um, support uh, uh, structures for LGBTI rights. Uh, since two years ago, we have now financed, uh, funded three structures to support LGBTI uh, uh, people. One is a shelter in the north of Portugal. It's run by an NGO on LGBTQI rights. And two other are in, in Lisbon. One is more focusing on the needs of young people facing bullying and other types of situation. And the other one is more of a uh, uh, first uh, um, counseling center for uh, there's no age restriction whomever feels they need, uh, they need support. So we're using public funds to ensure that we start having structures to support. We're also, we also have a funding line where NGOs can apply and develop their awareness raising uh, uh, projects, uh, work with schools, develop studies. Uh, is, this is also funded by the EU. We have a, a small fund, but it's, it's very small. Uh, Alice uh, is uh, underlining and I, I, I uh, I agree. Uh, it's 50,000 euro per year. We started last year with 30,000 euro. This year is 50,000 euro. But these are for small projects because we also know that some LGBTI uh, NGOs, this is just for NGOs, are very recent and their structures are uh, still very uh, fragile. So the other funds, EU funds, can be quite heavy in terms of administrative burden. So these are uh, much lighter in terms of the um, the reporting and how to use the, the, the funds, the public funds. Yes, yes. Um, so I just wanted to uh, underline this, that this is something that we are worried about and we want to make sure that there's funds for these partnerships to also flourish and, and 
support us in, in, in our work. And I think I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to watch the, the video. It should take 10 minutes from the Secretary of State for Education. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be part of this event. And I would like to first thank you for inviting me for this panel and for this discussion. I also congratulate you for the achievements of this uh, important project to broaden our knowledge uh, on such important topics uh, because they are about human beings and they are about the happiness of many, of many people. And uh, I would also like to apologize for not being able to be uh, physically there. I had to. Um, I just heard two days ago that I had to be uh, in Paris this morning, but I did not want to uh, miss the opportunity for being with you, uh, even at a distance. And uh, I, I, I thank, in particular, uh, Cristina Santos for this uh, for this opportunity. Um, I, I had I had the chance to look at the results of your project. They are uh, uh, an important set. They constitute an important set of uh, information for us who, who, who have uh, who are assuming functions in which we can uh, help uh, improving the quality of life of people to make uh, better decisions and uh, deciding uh, is always about knowledge and is always always about information. Uh, I cannot conceive. Uh, taking part of, uh, of, uh, of a government as I do right now and not taking action on the basis uh, of information. And for us, it's very important that we have evidence-based policies. And uh, when, uh, when we talk about education policies, uh, we are necessarily talking about the quality of democracies. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a very well-known sentence by President Mandela that education is the best weapon to transform the world. And uh, a world of quality is, uh, of course, a world in which there is a clear place, and I would say the only place uh, for democracy. And school and education and uh, the opportunities that, that education can provide are widely recognized as the most important tool uh, for uh, granting the success of democracy. And when we, when, we, when we talk about what does it mean uh, to have a democratic schooling, uh, at the very beginning, uh, and in many countries still, we are talking about granting access to education to all. But now we know that this is not enough. And when we look at uh, uh, the Sustainability Development Goal number four, approved by the United Nations, which means which which states that the goal is education education of quality for all, uh, we know that it's not sufficient to grant access. We also have to grant success to all. We have to make sure that all students who enter school will be able to leave school having effective learnings, effective learning experiences. And um, then we raise the question, but what is a successful student? What does it mean to be successful? What does it mean to have a school that achieves this role of granting quality education for all? And this is when we start making options and when we start uh, taking decisions. And for us in the Portuguese government, it was very clear and it's very clear and it's actually a shared, uh, a shared uh, opinion and a shared way of building policy uh, uh, with many other countries in the world is that a successful education is an education that empowers all our uh, uh, young children and youngsters for an active citizenship. That is to say, uh, you will not be a successful student, uh, you will not be a successful citizen if education is not empowering, we, empowering you with the knowledge uh, that allows you to make uh, conscious decisions uh, for your own well-being and for your community's uh, well-being. And this has uh, some very, very practical implications. First of, first of all, uh, we... we we get to a point in which we understand that uh, education is not only about knowing lists of facts, uh, knowing, having rote learning memory strategies and memory routines for knowledge that we memorize one day and that we uh, forget the other day. 
uh, in the education is about a notion of competence that encompasses knowledge, skills, attitudes, and values. And this then gets difficult because it's very easy for me as a teacher to have you repeat whatever I have said. It's much more difficult to identify the good set of values, and it's very, very difficult to uh, um, make sure that all students can live and experience these values. And it's even more complicated to uh, have uh, to be able to take decisions on what is the set of right values. Then things get really, really difficult. Uh, for this reason, here in Portugal, we launched a big national uh, debate uh, on this question. What does it mean to be successful? And we approved the document, a very important document that is now the big umbrella for the curriculum called the student profile uh, by the end of compulsory schooling. And the student profile identifies the set of competencies uh, that all subjects can contribute to uh, defining what is a, uh, 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 what does it mean to achieve in school. And here we're talking about knowledge, of course, but also uh, being able to create, to think uh, critically, to analyze information, to be creative, to be inclusive, to be able to cooperate with the others uh, fighting these uh, um, routines and these habits of having school as a championship in which every student has to be the best uh, no matter what happens to the others. Uh, and this implies a culture, a culture of school and an approach to the curriculum that really takes into consideration this uh, broader set of competencies that is being, that is being defined. And uh, for, for making this real, for not just having uh, a nice piece of, of uh, uh, information that, uh, that we then um, put in the schools and we ask the schools to develop, we took action uh, in the way the curriculum is organized. Um, and for this, uh, besides uh, aspects that I will not really uh, go into in detail, like uh, inducing more project-based learning, uh, more interdisciplinary uh, um, links between the different subjects, one important aspect was to reintroduce in a Portuguese curriculum uh, citizenship ed ed education. And, and this, is, this is actually, uh, let me... Uh, share with you what, what it means in terms of policy development. Um, whenever there is some statistic on uh, road crashes, on uh, uh, health, on um, violence, everyone says school should be, do the education system should be doing something about it. Except for that moment in which we decide to add citizenship education uh, in the curriculum. Then some voices uh, uh, say, this is not the mission of the school, this is for the family to do. Now, this uh, immediately takes me to uh, one third uh, uh, action in, in, in our policymaking pro procedure, which is uh, the law we recently approved on inclusive education. Uh, if we say this is the role of the family, we may neglecting all those students that, that actually do not have a family, or they don't have the family with the intellectual background or the socioeconomic background to provide them with uh, the needed uh, skills, the needed attitudes, the needed values. Um, and when we're talking about inclusion, we are talking about a, a, a condition for education in which all means all. That is, uh, we don't want education to be for the privileged ones, we don't want uh, education. We cannot talk about quality education when there are many children left behind. Uh, uh, we're talking about quality education when education accomplishes its goal of providing social mobility on the one hand and uh, contributing, actively contributing to a more sustainable uh, democracy. Now, this has implications. When we bring together the dimension of inclusion in education and the dimension of citizenship education, this has very clear uh, implications. Uh, one of them is that we are necessarily taking, uh, bringing into the curriculum the development of social and emotional skills. All of a sudden, well-being is not only a prerequisite for learning, it's uh, an objective of, of, of school. School serves the purpose 
the purpose of promoting uh, well-being. And this is why the student profile uh, 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 has uh, these dimensions, critical thinking, problem solving, collaborative work, uh, aesthetic and artistic sensitivity, uh, because without these dimensions, we'll not be able to look at the others as part of a group in which everyone uh, belongs. Um, now, in this context, uh, when we have citizenship in ed education, we decided in Portugal to have as one of the compulsory topics for this for this area of the curriculum, uh, gender equality. Now, as you can imagine, these uh, there are voices that uh, and the sectors of the society that uh, really fight this 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 decision, and they always talk about the gender ideology uh, uh, issue and. Uh, once in a debate in which I participated, I said, well, I'm always surprised because when I try to look for references on gender ideology, I only find those texts written by those who are afraid of talking about gender equality. Um, and this is what we inscribe in our curriculum. It's not gender uh, ideology because I don't think it really exists. Uh, what we what we put in our curriculum is the issue of gender equality. And then the question is why? Uh, and this is where uh, your data and your information is very important for us. Um, and the why is because we still have uh, major gender uh, inequalities in our society. Uh, things are getting better here in Portugal and in many other countries, but there's still a lot to be done. Uh, differences between men and women uh, in uh, access to top positions in careers, in their salaries. We have uh, violence in relationships among adolescents. Uh, uh, Omar, one of our uh, partner associations, did uh, conducted a study on uh, how uh, adolescents perceived uh, relationships and a very significant and worrying percentage of our uh, teenagers uh, consider that uh, uh, forcing sexual uh, relationships with their girlfriend was not a, uh, was not a violent behavior and this is this is very very worrying uh, because now they think this in the future they can be, they can become uh, the actors of uh, of violence uh, we also know that we have and uh, ilga also did a study uh, in some schools here in Portugal, we have clear cases of uh, homophobic attitudes, uh, biphobic, transphobic attitudes uh, in our schools, not necessarily performed by other students, sometimes even performed uh, by adults. Uh, we have information from uh, our, our society of psychology that homophobic, homophobic bullying uh, in schools is one of the major causes of depression among uh, uh, adolescents. Um, so, uh, um, and we had also a big, uh, a big debate on on uh, on the gender identity issues. And when we bring these things to the to the, the core of our discussions, uh, we are talking really talking about those children who do not feel well in school because they are victims of discrimination, and because they don't feel well, they will not be want, they will not be wanting to be in school. They will not be available for 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 learning. So when we are faced with these facts, when we are faced with data uh, of this kind, we have two options. Either we say, like those who do not want to talk about gender equality, uh, we just shrug our shoulders and say, too bad, this is not our problem. This is something for the families to do. But sometimes some of these children do not have the space at home uh, to, be, to be able to, 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 to discuss the issues. And sometimes they their only hope is a well-informed teacher that can help them uh, uh, um, accept themselves. So the other option is not to shrug our shoulders and take action. Uh, and taking action is about uh, the curriculum on the first on the first uh, on the first place. Um, and why is this curriculum? Because this is about knowledge. Uh, the worst you can do is not to talk about the difference. Is not to talk about the different options. Is not to talk about the different uh, scenarios and the different uh, identities that 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 are. Uh, that are uh, when we don't talk, we stimulate violence. And why sometimes I use this image? If I enter a dark room and I hear a noise and I'm holding a stick in my hand, I'm afraid because I don't see, uh, and because I don't see. I can, you know, just hold my stick and attack whoever is in there. 
if someone turns on the light, maybe I will find out that there is no reason to be afraid and I, will not do, I won't have to use my stick and I will not be violent. And this is what happens with some of these homophobic, biphobic, transphobic behaviors is that people are afraid uh, because they don't know and therefore they become violent. So talking about this in the curriculum is empowering our uh, uh, youngest generation with the knowledge to reflect and not to be violent. Um, I, I don't like uh, the word tolerance is the one, the, the one word I'm a linguist. And, uh, and uh, so I pay attention to words and I don't like the word tolerance because I never want someone to, to look at me and say, I tolerate you. Uh, I want people to like me, uh, to, to be frank with me, to be open with me, to let me be uh, whoever I am and what I want to be. And when we're talking about inclusion, we are not talking about tolerance. We're talking about the importance of developing a sense of belongingness. Uh, I have to feel that I belong in my society. Otherwise, I will not feel well there. And if there is a wide consensus in the countries of the world that education, the ultimate goal of education is to provide well-being, then uh, we have, we necessarily have to develop this sense of belongingness so that uh, well-being is a fact, is a reality, and not just an aspiration that does not turn into practice. So this is part of what we're trying to do uh, here in Portugal. Uh, I, I tried to give you a bit of a, a general background on, on, uh, on facts and on uh, the, the, the measures of uh, educational policy that we are carrying on. We are investing on teacher training. Uh, but mostly where we are investing on the, the, the happiness of uh, the children who attend school nowadays. Uh, let me again apologize for not being there with you and really congratulate you for the outcomes of this project. Thank you so much.